patients. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm Brian. I have the pleasure and honor of hosting this morning. Hope everyone's doing well on this beautiful snowy day. Um, raise your hand if you got a snow day out of the deal. Snow day, right on. Okay. Can I get a little whoop whoop? Yes. Um, I hope you don't mind me sharing, but uh, Katie is a teacher in Kalamazoo. She got kind of gypped on her snow day. She was coming back from Sherman Lake Camp, and uh, she would have been home by noon, but you said that one of the buses got stuck, so she didn't end up getting home till like 2.30, so it was really a full day of work. <laughs> yes. Maybe like you got out a half hour early or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, not as satisfying. We're, we'll hope that Katie gets a full day, full snow day next time. That'd be good. <laughs> All right, so uh, we just have a few announcements, but we're going to start out with good things. Does anybody have a good thing to share today that you want to share with uh, with everybody around us? It's a little bit of celebration. Yes, Abe. Oh, it's the Fuel Day. Yes, today at Fuel, that is one of our announcements. Fuel is for six to twelfth graders, so you guys will be in there soon, right? <laughs> how how old are you guys? Are you sixth grade? Actually, you could come to Fuel today, and believe it or not, we have pizza. We also have, we have a really cool Bible story that goes along with that. Then, we have an epic Nerf gun battle. And don't worry, um, Abe brought like 65 Nerf guns. So Didn't say the exact number. Not the exact number, but he has lots of them, so you are welcome to We've stay. got a back full. Yes, and we have lots of bullets too, so, or, or Nerf, what do you call them, Nerf? Darts, thank you, not bullets. So, yes, so you can think about that, it'd be awesome. All right, so, um, let's, yeah, I always call them bullets too. I don't, Willis and I call them bullets, it's hard to uh, to change it. Projectiles, that's another good way to say. Yes. Projectiles. Yes, yes, so, but they're family friendly projectiles, so that's good. All right. So we do have fuel today, we have kids community today, all right, and we also uh, have something called the Christmas Giving Project. More details will be given about that, but it is actually, there's a little thing in the weekly that you can check out about that, but we have a special guest coming up right now to tell us more about the Christmas Giving Project. All right, let's give a round of applause to our special guest right here, Rebecca Bell. Come on, guys. Okay. okay, I can just talk with this. Good morning. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to fill you in a little bit on the Christmas Giving Project this year. This is something we do every December um, to bless the community in some way and just ask folks to consider as part of your um, family sort of celebration of Christmas to consider giving um, kind of above and beyond regular giving for the purpose of a particular project. And so often we'll give to an organization um, that is doing good work that we partner with, but this year we're going to do things just a little bit differently because um, Alice, is, um, Alice is a social worker. She works for Samaritas, and through her work she has um, a connection with a family this year that just is in really particular need. So there is, again, there are some details about this inside the weekly, but this is a grandma who has taken in her 11-year-old grandson who had gone through a number of placements in the foster care system, a number of prospective adoptions, I think that maybe fell through, and he has some pretty challenging issues, so the grandma has had to commit herself to caring for him full time um, and not able to work right now because his needs are so intense. <clears throat> and she's also often caring for other grandchildren as well. And so the family, she just has some really specific needs, like some things that, um, like they need beds for the kids and just some things like that. And so we would like to give specifically for this grandma so that she, um, has what she needs in her sacrificial care for her um, her grandson. And um, we're, we had talked about whether it would make the most sense for us to collect items to give to them, or if it would make the most sense just to collect money. And it looks like it really would be most helpful if we collect money. And then we'll either give it through 
the social service agency that is working with her, um, or we may have to do some gift cards or some things like that. We're still kind of figuring out some of that. Typically, with our Christmas giving projects, we would be encouraging people to give um, like on Christmas Eve. So we have a Christmas Eve gathering, people would give at that point, and then, you know, we would announce in January, like this is what we were able to offer to um, our partners. This year, we actually want to collect funds for this early so that hopefully we can bless this family prior to Christmas. So just something to be thinking about. Um, often we'll have some special giving envelopes inside the weekly and the weeks running up to Christmas for that. We don't have that together yet, but if you wanted to give toward that, anytime starting now, you could earmark, you know, you could just write your memo section of a check or um, we'll, we'll create a box you can click if you give online that shows that it's for that. We haven't quite done that yet, but we can do that. So um, just to put a bug in your ear about, um, about that coming up. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. All right, so before we go into singing together this morning in worship, let's start with today's first word, uh, which is out of Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Let's stand if you're able this morning to go into your time of worship, your music as we sing together.
today in worship because we have that joy in the Lord together. So let's continue to sing to our God as we celebrate that there's nothing that can separate us from him, nothing as far as we can go away from him, that his love never fails.
Sometimes in the midst of the darkness and the shadows and, and in the pain in the night that we were singing about, that it's hard to see that and it's hard to know that there's light in the end of the tunnel. But we know that us being in you and you being in our lives, that we have hope. And in the very end scheme of things, we all we have a, a hope that's beyond all things. And so we can trust in you and know that you are a good God and that you love us. We thank you that we have the opportunity and privilege to be before you this morning to sing these songs of praises to you, to lift our hearts to you, to recognize who we are in you. And so we thank you again for that. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. And you guys see. Right. I'm going to invite kids to come on up and chat with me a minute, and I'm actually going to keep my mask on. We'll see how that works with the microphone, since you guys are facing me, because I just had a little bit of a bug, so I want to keep everybody healthy here. Right? You guys get some days off from school, and are any of you looking forward to Thanksgiving? Yeah? Do you have any favorite Thanksgiving foods? Stuffing. Stuffing. Yeah, that's one of my favorites too. What about you, Joey? Do you have a favorite? I also yes. love that. Yes. <laughs> what about you other guys? Any thoughts about favorite Thanksgiving treats? Apple pie. Apple pie. That is a really good one. I don't even know how to pick a favorite. I have so many favorites. I'm looking forward to good food. So Thanksgiving is, it's a feast, right? And it's a celebration. And we're going to be talking today in church, and I think you guys are going to talk in KC, about how as followers of Jesus, we have certain celebrations that we do to help us remember things about who God is. And so, like we celebrate Christmas, where we remember that Jesus was born, and we celebrate Easter, where we remember Jesus rose from the dead, right? But we have other celebrations that we do that down through history, a lot of people who follow Jesus have celebrated. Did you know that today, even, is one of those special days? We're not even going to talk about it very much here with the grown-ups, but today is something called Christ the King Sunday. Raise your hand if you knew that, grown-ups too. Yeah, that's, um, thank you. Yeah, it's part of sort of the calendar of things that we can celebrate as followers of Jesus, that Jesus is our King. So have you, have you guys ever gotten one of those crowns, like from Burger King or like a paper crown? That's kind of like what we think about kings wearing, right? What does it mean that Jesus is our king? What does that mean? What does that tell us about Jesus? Any thoughts about that? Does it tell us that Jesus is in charge of the world? Yeah, kings, they either in charge, right? And a good king, 
um, can make sure that people are taken care of and that people are treated well and have what they need. And so we look forward to when Jesus comes again and we get to see Jesus really being, um, we get to see Jesus as king. That will be a really good day. But if you think about what kind of, this is something we think about around Easter time, what kind of crown did Jesus wear when he was alive on earth? Joey, did you have a crown of thorns? That's right, that he was mocked, wasn't he? And when they, when the people killed Jesus, they, they mocked him and said, oh, you think you're a king, huh? They put a crown of thorns on his head. And so when we think about Jesus as our king, we remember that Jesus was willing to suffer and really be hurt because he loved us so much. It was worth it to him to go through that so he can be our good king. That's really good news. Um, I, Joey already poured the water, and I already lit the candle, but would somebody be willing to put the Bible up on the table this morning? Does anybody want to do that? Joey, you want to do that? All right. I get those boots, boot laces taken care of first. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to pray for you guys. So, uh, Joey, how about I pray, and then after you can put it up there, okay? Lord God, thank you for these kids, and thank you that... They are a beloved part of your family. I pray that you would show them each more and more deeply what it means that you are their king and that you are the king of all creation. I pray that they would honor you and we would honor you um, as, our, as our good and faithful king. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks for coming up and talking to me. You guys can go on out to KC now. Thank you, Joey. All right, I'm going to take this off. <clears throat> all right. Well, it's good to see you all this morning. And to those of you who uh, decided to stay in on this snowy day, we're glad that you can join us online. If I haven't met you, I'm Rebecca Ball, pastor here at Threads. So over the past couple of weeks, we have been talking about various elements of our life together as a worshiping community and, <clears throat> and considering together, why do we do that? So we've talked about why do we have a regular spiritual talk? Why do we sing and worship? Last week we talked about baptism and why that's something that we practice. And then today we're going to talk about why do we um, observe elements of the church year. So um, and this is the final week of this series, and then we are into Advent, which was hard to believe a week or so ago when it was 75 degrees. I feel like uh, the weather has helped, helped me feel like, oh yes, it is, that season is upon us. Um, before I jump into the topic for this morning, though, I do want to mention that and I meant to mention this last week when I spoke on baptism, but if you have not been baptized and are interested in being baptized or just want to explore further what that might look like, um, feel free to talk to me. I would love to have a conversation about that um, because as we discussed last week, that is a really valued part of um, the life of faith. Sorry, I'm going to, I don't need my phone up here. I don't have slides this morning. I had a few, uh, a few days of being under the weather this week, and so there were just some things that didn't get done, and slides were among those. Before we jump into the talk for this morning, though, I'd love to take a moment and just pray together, so let's do that. Holy Spirit, we recognize that you are here, that you are among us, that you are at work. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to see you and open our ears to hear you. We ask that you would help us to um, have open hearts to what you are saying today. We ask that you would shape us and form us um, according to your heart for us. 
And we thank you, Lord, that your heart for us is good, and it's welcoming, and it's forgiving, and it's loving. And I ask that we would all hear that anew this morning, and that we would um, be refreshed in our love for you, in our love for each other, and in our um, clarity about our call to be your people and to be um, in relationship with you, Jesus. In your own name we pray. Amen. So as we talk about the church year this morning and why we observe that, I have some handouts. I don't know, Joel, if you want to start those around. There are more of them on the back table. And there is a little basket of crayons back there and some clipboards. It's a coloring page, so if any of you feel like coloring it, um, you certainly can. But it's a visual of the church year that I just think is kind of nifty. It's specifically for this upcoming uh, church year. And like I said to the kids, today is Christ the King Sunday, um, which is actually the last week of the church year. So next Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, is the beginning of a new church year. Um, and so that's how it, how it kind of runs. So the dates start with Advent of this year and then run through the rest of 2023. So um, when my kids were little, they would often get confused about the difference between months and seasons, or between the difference, they get confused about the difference between seasons and holidays. So it was kind of like autumn was October was Halloween, right? They were just kind of like, that was the same thing. Or like, December is winter is Christmas. So when they were little, those things were just kind of synonymous. But even as an adult, I find that knowing that there are holidays or celebrations to look forward to helps me get through like the doldrums of Michigan winter. So as, as winter settles in around us, I think, okay, we have Christmas, I do New Year's, and then I read my daughter Iris's birthday, and Valentine's Day, and then Abby's birthday, and then we're through the worst of it, you know? Although Iris's birthday is in February, Abby's is in April, we don't have anything to celebrate in March, which is really sad. So I've been thinking maybe we ought to start observing National Meatball Day on yes. March 9th. <laughs> or we could opt for National Respect Your Cat Day on March 28th. Yeah. Need something to add some color to those gloomy final days of winter. So we human beings have kind of an innate desire or innate need to mark time with special celebrations and remembrances, and we just tend to do that in an annual pattern. So anthropologists have identified a number of different reasons for this. I'm sorry to keep fussing with this, but for whatever reason, so for one thing, life is full of unknowns and anxieties, right? There's just a lot that we don't know about what's going to happen. But science has shown us that for human beings, rituals and traditions help ease that, that anxiety. When we kind of, there are things that we know what to expect. Things might be chaotic at work or stressful at school, but I know I can count on stuffing and cranberry sauce and turkey and apple pie on Thursday. Very often there's comfort in that. Now, of course, it's complicated, right? Because for many of us, there are also complicated family issues or whatever around holidays. So it might feel more comforting to some and less to others. But, um, but ritual and tradition is just built into kind of our DNA as human beings. And, um, you know, we human beings actually find more than just sort of comfort and warm fuzzies from observing traditions or recurring holidays. These events actually become part of our identity. They create a really strong sense of group belonging within families and within whole cultures. So, I mean, think about the way that people get really passionate about whether you're allowed to put up your Christmas tree or listen to Christmas music before Thanksgiving, right? It's like 
that is not the way it's done. Because we feel this sense of like identity and group belonging around the way that we engage our traditions and our celebrations. Or think about different like ethnic holidays or ethnic expressions um, of holiday um, experience. So my family uh, attended a reformed church for a period of time and most people in that church were uh, very strongly of Dutch heritage. And every year for one holiday, and I can't remember for the life of me whether it was Christmas or Easter, they would make and serve um, Olivalen. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but have you, any of you ever had that? It's their donuts, but better. It's it's like Dutch for fat balls, which is why they're so good. <laughs> so, um, and as it was such a strong tradition as a non-Dutch person, I felt a little out of the loop. Like I said, I can't even remember if it was for Easter or Christmas, but that was like a big part culturally of what one does for that uh, for that particular holiday. Um, so other cultures have their own traditions and celebrations, other variations on how we celebrate certain holidays, or of course, um, holidays or celebrations that are particular to a unique ethnic group. And these holidays, they serve to strengthen this sense of group identity and to keep reminding a group or a culture of particular values and memories and um, connection points. So our holidays and our celebrations have a lot of power to form us in certain ways. They remind us of who we are. They remind us that we belong to each other, they that we have a shared story, and that we share certain values. So like, you know, Thanksgiving with all of its complicated, I mean, we could talk more about the complicated uh, history, but at least the, the sentiment is that it is an opportunity to celebrate gratitude, right? So that's a value, that's a cultural value that is um, lifted up every year in the celebration of Thanksgiving. And then we're vaulted into the, Christ the Christmas season where we ideally celebrate things like uh, generosity and joy and family, right? Those are things that tend to be kind of knit into our sense of what Christmas is all about. So here, I'm talking mainly about secular holidays or just, you know, holidays that have kind of become part of our general culture. And I'm, I've talked about the kind of anthropological explanations for why human beings want to do this stuff. But as followers of Jesus, it's always appropriate and even delightful to thoroughly engage with these sort of scientific understandings of like, oh, this seems to be kind of hardwired into how human beings are, and to say, well, where is God at work in that, in that part of what it means to be human? Um, so, you know, one way to put this was, why did God plant these particular needs and desires in our hearts? But before we get into that, I want to take a quick rabbit trail, because I realize that um, as I'm talking about some scientific stuff or anthropology and then asking, like, well, why did God plant these things in the human heart? I believe that we can ask that question fully and sincerely, even um, for those of us who believe that God has thoroughly used natural processes like evolution um, to shape the created world. So we can ask, what are God's purposes in creating us to be like this? Even if we don't believe in like a literal seven-day seven creation. We can affirm that God is our creator, that God has created the human, um, human being with intention and purpose, no matter what processes science shows us were involved in our development. And I bring this up because I think sometimes, especially for those of us who have a long history in evangelicalism or in the church, I think that we can, 
it can feel a little frustrating or get, it gets to where it sounds a little bit like magical thinking maybe to say like, well, why did God design us in such and such a way? And it's like, well, um, we've used that sometimes only, we've heard it used only in reference to literal understandings of the seven, seven day creation stories in Genesis. And so I just think that it might be helpful for some of us to hear an invitation into holding two things to be true at once. That the world and everything in it, including everything that it means to be human, is absolutely created by God. And yet at the same time, we can affirm that God, I mean, I personally affirm that God can use whatever natural processes to um, work out creation. So as Christians, we can listen to people like biologists and anthropologists and sociologists without feeling defensive. We can just delight in the findings of those who contemplate the creation that God so loves. And we can learn more about God and God's amazing wisdom and creativity as we engage science and discovery non-defensively. So there's, there's no conflict there. That's really what I want to get across. So, back to our question. Why did God plant the need for ritual and remembrance and celebration in the human heart? Or to frame the question in a slightly different way, where is God at work in all of this? In our inclination to celebrate and to commemorate and to create rituals. So there are a couple of specific things we can observe about God's heart for relationship with God's people as we think about marking time, and marking kind of the, the annual cycle of time with remembrances and celebrations. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But first, finally going to get to our, our reading our passage for this morning. And that is going to be just a few little bits from the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, where God instructs Moses um, as to the various festivals and celebrations that God is giving to the people. So Leviticus might just be, at least in the circles in which I traveled, one of the least preached out of books of the Bible. It's one of the books that probably feels the most strange and foreign and even offensive to us. Um, it's mostly full of instructions that God gives to Moses on behalf of the people of Israel. And there's just lots of rules and regulations that sound fairly, a lot of them would sound fairly nonsensical to us. Leviticus um, presents various rules as to how to do the sacrifices and offerings God was asking the people to do. And there are rules kind of governing the lives of the priesthood. And then purity rules of various kinds. So things that people shouldn't do or should stay away from um, because they would cause defilement. And then there are various procedures for sort of seeking purity from God and be becoming undefiled and cleansed. So, I feel like this is the morning of important rabbit trails. Before we read our reading, I just want to address that a little bit too. Um, because again, this part of the Bible has been used in abusive ways. Um, anyone with modern sensibilities only has to read a few verses and you're going to feel like, what is this? Um, and some of the regulations even really seem to disadvantage vulnerable people like women or people who might be suffering from some kind of, you know, eczema or something. So um, even though we're not dealing with all those parts of the book, I just think that it's important to kind of touch on, like, why aren't we just tossing it out? Like, why are we reading from Leviticus? What does it really have to do with us? So we're just going to touch the edge of this this morning. We're not really going to go super deeply into it, but the main thing I want to say is that um, this section of the Bible, some of these early books and the law that God gives to Moses, they mostly had to do with setting apart the people of Israel in a way that was distinct from the surrounding nations and in a way that, that formed their whole lives around um, worship of Yahweh, of the God of Israel. And so if you compare the laws and regulations of Leviticus to other 
systems of law in the ancient world, you'll find that there are a lot of similarities, but also that there were, even though to us a lot of it feels really icky, it was actually much more um, just and um, equitable than a lot of the other um, systems in surrounding cultures. And so, um, but again, this was about cultural identity. This was about forming a people around the worship of the one God and rejecting the idolatry and um, you know, various practices associated that with, with that in surrounding nations. So that's just in a nutshell. <clears throat> um, but, uh, and then some of these commandments, again, kind of helped form strong group identity and helped people begin that sense of being a story-formed people. Like we talked about a little bit last week with our baptism talk, um, that uh, God is, is shaping the people through the story of who God is and what God expects from God's people. So in that little bit of context, we're going to read from Leviticus 23. There was no really great way to pick which parts to read because Leviticus 23 lays out all the festivals. It's really long. So we're just going to read the first part that just does, we'll read through kind of the instructions for the first festival just so you get a taste for it. So we'll read verses 1 through... 14. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed festivals, the appointed festivals of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work. Wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present a food offering to the Lord. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land I'm going to give you, and you reap its harvest, bring to the priests a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day you wave the sheep, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to the Lord a lamb, a year old, without defect, together with its grain offering of two-tenths of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with olive oil, a food offering presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering of a quarter of a hin of wine. You must not eat any bread or, roast, or roasted or new grain until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. And then it goes on and keeps establishing several more of these, um, of these festivals. Isn't, isn't it kind of fascinating how specific it is? Like, you wave this thing and then it's acceptable. And again, it's not because it's magical, but it's because it's about, like, shaping. It's about shaping the people in this observance of worship of the God of Israel. So this brief reading covered Sabbath and then Passover and the Festival of First Fruits. Um, and, you know, Jewish people continue to celebrate these festivals to this day, plus Hanukkah, which was added um, later. So science tells us, again, and our own lives confirm that we're wired for festivals and holidays. And we see in Leviticus that God provides Israel with these six festivals in these yearly rhythms of celebration and rest and remembering their story. Um, but again, what does this really have to do with us? We're, most of us at least, not Jewish. We're not celebrating these festivals. And we don't have any desire to go back to a Leviticus world with Leviticus rules, right? 
So if your stomach was clenching up and you were thinking, oh my gosh, she's, got to, she's going to tell us that we have to start celebrating the Jewish festivals. No. <laughs> Just relax. I am not. <laughs> I promise I wouldn't do that to you. I actually think the Jewish holidays are super cool, but I'm not Jewish, so I can appreciate them from the outside. But we would do well to take a page from ancient Israel's book and recognize that our calendar and our holidays and celebrations shape us. They are part of what forms us around a certain story. So this brings us finally to sort of the heart of a conversation about why do we at Threads celebrate, kind of casually celebrate elements of the church year? And why we're maybe even moving a little bit more in that direction, building in a little bit more tradition, a little bit more ritual. You know, we've got these gestures up here, right, with the candle and the water, and those are things that we've built in that we hadn't done in the past. So I'll make three brief observations about why. First, based on everything I've just said about anthropology and understanding human nature and all of that, that it makes sense for us as a worshiping community to shape our life together around annual rhythms of celebration and remembrance because we just acknowledge that's part of what makes us tick. And the church year is a wonderful resource for helping us to do that. Beyond simply giving us Christmas and Easter, which growing up as a kid in the evangelical church, that was all, um, all we observed. Um, the church year gives us Advent, which begins next Sunday, and it's four weeks of remembrance of, um, of waiting in the sense of not only was the world waiting for the Messiah when Jesus came, but we sense the waiting in our own spirits, and we are all waiting for the second advent of Christ, when, when Jesus comes again and makes all things new. And then Christmas, and then, um, you know, there are other things like Epiphany that we haven't really done very much about around here, but then we have Easter, but prior to Easter is the 40-day season of Lent. And again, this is a very helpful season of kind of recognizing realities like the dark night of the soul and experiences of spiritual wilderness and remembering things like Jesus 40 days and fasting in the wilderness and Israel wandering for 40 days and, and recognizing our own sinfulness and need and remembering why we needed Jesus to die for us. Why, why does that even make sense? Lent is a season of preparation to, to um, meditate on all of that. And then there are other things like um, Trinity Sunday and Pentecost and All Saints Day that we have um, observed in one way or another this past year. So um, the church year is a way for us to build memories and traditions and rituals together to establish a deeper sense of like, our shared story around some of the main themes of God's story as revealed in Scripture. And then a second observation I would make about why I think it's valuable to observe um, the church year in some way is that there's just some humility and stability to be found in aligning ourselves with other followers of Jesus throughout the world and throughout history. There's just, there's wisdom in this, recognizing that, you know, gosh, a lot of the church has done this stuff. Maybe there's a reason for it. And I really felt that this year when we celebrated, when we observed All Saints Day for the first time. That's something that we've never done before. But we decided to do an All Saints Day virtual gathering this year um, when we started thinking about the way that for those of us who have been part of more of the kind of non-denominational, non-traditional church world, we just don't have a regular way to remember together and honor together the memory of those who have died in the Lord. Um, and it just feels really valuable to take, a, you know, to take a moment and remember that they're alive with Christ right now and that we look forward to the day when we will all experience resurrection and be together. And so, you know, it makes a lot of sense and it's like, 
Well, what do you know? <laughs> Much of church history has recognized our need to do that. That's why we have All Saints Day. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. That's something that, um, that's the wisdom of the ages, recognizing that that is a need that we have. So there's wisdom and humility and just joining with siblings in Christ um, in some of these patterns. And then the third and final observation I would make about why I think this is valuable is that God likes a good party. <laughs> God made us with just a hardwired desire to celebrate. And I hope that through upcoming years, we here at Threads can partner together to keep growing, developing like really fun and meaningful and colorful and creative ways to celebrate different elements of the church year. So in a, in a way, the core question around celebration of the church year is, how do we party and win? And that's like the central question. Not because of some legalistic or sort of compulsive idea, like this is the right way to do it, but simply because each of these special days and seasons are an invitation to join God in some rich and deep and memorable celebration. So this is the God who invited Israel back in Leviticus 23 to stop all regular work, you know, over and over. That was part of like every single one of these festivals, sometimes for a day, sometimes for like bookend days on either side, sometimes for a whole week. Stop all regular festivals, feast, hang out together, or stop all regular work, I mean. So God invites us into rest, into celebration, together, into days and seasons to look forward to. It's a way of being storm, formed by the story of God, by the story of our redemption. So the church year kind of helps us keep saying yes to God's invitation into deeply storied memory, into rest and into celebration in every season of the year and in every season of our lives. <clears throat> so we're going to end our time of worship together this morning, again, with communion, as we always do. And communion, of course, is one of the core rituals uh, for those of us who follow Jesus. It's another one of these ways that we connect in an embodied way with the story of who God is and of who we are. As we participate physically and spiritually in receiving nourishment from the body of Christ through eating this bread that represents Jesus' body and drinking this cup. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, Paul writes, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So just as the various elements of the church year try imperfectly to help us remember who we are and who God is, communion does this with particular power. I mean, Jesus told us to do this. Jesus established this ritual himself. And he knew that we needed this embodied experience. Not only does communion help us remember that we are saved and redeemed and beloved children of God, thanks to Jesus' willingness to give his life as a sacrifice for us, but it's also a symbolic meal, a symbolic feast at the table of Christ our King, who, who will reign forever in love and justice, healing and peace. So when you're ready, Come to the table. Willis is going to lead us in another song of worship. Feel free to sing or just soak in the words and the music. Um, I'm going to move this hand sanitizer up to the middle. So come up the middle aisle, grab some hand sanitizer. And then um, regular bread is in the basket. 
Take a piece, dip it in a cup of juice, and there's also gluten-free bread um, on the plate.
Bibles to Gravel Weekly this morning, you may have noticed that there are two passages listed on the front. And I'm going to read the second one now. That's Revelation 22, 13. And it's where um, Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So as we think about time, we can think about time as sort of cyclical, right? And that's what we were talking about this morning with the church year. We have seasons that come back around again, the weekly cycle of, of worship and reading this morning about Sabbath. And I think the church year helps us to remember that Jesus is the beginning and the end of all of that, of all parts of it, that wherever we are in the year, it's Jesus here and Jesus and remembering this, the whole story about Jesus' birth and life and death and resurrection and ascension and all of it. But then time is also linear, and we think from creation and through history and to a point in history when Jesus will come again. And in that sense as well, Jesus is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. So however we think of time and how we're formed in and through time, Jesus is, is there for us, is the foundation of all of it. And I experience that as good news, and I know that I need all the reminders I can get to keep me anchored in that good reality. So as we go out from here this morning, let us remember that Jesus is also closer to you than you are to yourself in every single moment. That the Holy Spirit is nearer than your own breath. And that you are beloved of God the Father at every second, even when you're feeling undeserving, even when you're feeling forgetful of who you are. Uh, you are firmly anchored in our triune God who has given everything to, uh, to love you and to draw you into God's kingdom. Go in peace. Okay, great. I will grab it. Okay, hold on.